Hey, welcome to the Verge Mobile Show. This is episode 70 for the week of November 25th. It's uh, Turkey Week here in the U.S., uh, so it is Thanksgiving and lots to be thankful for. Uh, I'm Dan Seifert. I'm Evan Rogers. W where was Vlad on that? <laughs> Vlad just dropped out at the moment of truth. <laughs> so pro. Well, I am, I'm Chris Stigler. Uh, and apparently Vlad has decided not to join us. There was something about Dan's mention of Thanksgiving that made him very, very angry. Yeah, he just peaced he, out. <laughs> he dropped in a huff. Uh, and like to, was... be fair, to be fair, uh, Commonwealth countries do uh, Thanksgiving on different days. Or I don't know if it's Commonwealth countries or just Canada. I know that Canada had their Thanksgiving in October. Yeah, yeah but that's because winter starts in Canada like so much earlier that... Well, they're, I, they're just in perpetual winter, as far as I know. I don't <laughs> think there there is any other. The Great Frozen North. That's right. Oh, podcasts. So. So this has been a smooth start. Uh, I guess we should probably talk about, we should at least acknowledge the fact that Evan Rogers, our producer, is joining us for, I believe, his third appearance. Is that right? Yes. Yes, that is the case. That's uh, that's very very exciting, and the reason. Oh, and we we also have an infant joining us. This week. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Podcasting star. Uh, <laughs> that uh, I believe, um, and, and we're not going to spoil the surprise. Uh, actually, we are going to spoil the surprise. I believe, I'm being told, it's being fed into my ear as we speak. No, it's not. That Dieter may be joining us later. I, I still know why Dieter's not here, by the way. I'm going to uh, ask him about this later. Yes, yes. So I am sitting in for Dieter for the time being, and theoretically, he will, in fact, join us. Good. Good. And Vlad, uh, he is a person that exists, but not on the internet <laughs> for the moment. He is a person that exists, this is true. Um, so, yeah, that's what's up. That's podcasting. What are we talking so, about? So, do you guys want to talk about mobile stuff? I guess. Yes. I'm, I'm just looking at our... I, I, I'm admittedly looking at our topic list for the very first time. Uh, and uh, the top of the list is apparently three high-level BlackBerry executives have been given the uh, the old boot and shown the door. Uh, as I, John Chen is the new CEO, is starting to clean house and, and right the ship, it seems. Well, you know, as they say, uh, rearranging the deck chairs on the on the Titanic is always the way to go. Um, so that's my first question, <laughs> I guess. You know, knowing not very much about BlackBerry, um, like BlackBerry's corporate structure, I don't know how much these three individuals influenced um, kind of the the sinking, the Titanic, if you will. Well, I mean, again, I, we've we've said this in in past weeks. I, I mean, these that, are sea level executives, right? Yeah, they are, but I I don't think, I mean, anything that happened in the the period of time between the departure of Jim Belsilli and, and Mike Lazaridis and and BlackBerry today, I think it's very very difficult to attribute a lot of blame to anyone in the C suite up to and including um, uh, Torsten Hines because. They just didn't. Ha I mean, their their fate was kind of sealed by the time those guys were shown the door. Um, and and granted, there are probably things that they could have done to soften the blow, maybe. But yeah, and you have to you have to second guess Heinz's decision to push uh, the the launch of BlackBerry 10 out. What by three or four months, if not more. I can't remember how long he delayed it, but he delayed it for a while, and that may have hurt them a bit. But at the end of the day, I mean, it's six to one, half dozen the other. I mean, their their fate was sealed. I think so. That's my take. Yeah. Did we talk about the the uh, the Porsche design last week? I guess we did, didn't we? Yeah, because Vlad had one. <sighs> For reasons. I should, I should probably say hello. Oh, he's Vlad. here. Yeah, he's here. Nice. Vlad's here. I snuck in. I snuck in, but since I am completely uninformed about what those three people who left BlackBerry did or what their value was or where they're going, well, I, I mean, well just keep the, quiet. The, the the ones that at least uh, one of them has was a pretty public face. Frank Bulbin was the chief marketing officer. He was you know always out there talking about as much as as Heinz was at least talking about BlackBerry and its plans and things like that. Uh, and that's been a very important role in uh, hiring Alicia Keys, I guess. Um, so uh, you know it's a it's a high level executive position. I honestly, if somebody is going to be brought in as a fixer. 
upper type of person as what this in interim CEO John Chen is supposed to apparently be, then it only makes sense for him to, you know, uh, get rid of the old guard and, and figure out something new. So I'm not terribly surprised by this move. But like Chris said, uh, it's like rearranging the deck chairs in the Titanic. So I remember talking to Frank Goldman when he was first hired, um, which wasn't that long ago. He was hired by Heinz, uh, if, if memory serves me correctly. And I can't remember where he came from. Um, but yeah, he was, he was a pretty... I remember I I think I talked to him literally within a couple of weeks of him being hired, and I, I specifically remember asking him a bunch of questions and him being like, "Look, I don't know. I I just got here, <laughs> so, <laughs> so hopefully he was at least able to bring himself up to speed uh, on the company before he was shown the door." Here's my question: Why wasn't Alicia Keys uh, fired in a very public way? Why why hasn't any BlackBerry executive said, "You know what? We put a lot of faith and trust into Alicia to turn this company around." <laughs> She wasn't able to pull it off. We're gonna have to let her go. My I question mean, is, I, why wasn't she immediately promoted to like B level yeah. executive? Yeah, she should be the new chief executive. That would be incredible. I well, mean, it, actually, there especially is especially if she's still tweeting from her iPhone. <laughs> Yolo. There is one you thing that bugs me with all of these departures is that nobody seems to be willing to say the word "fired" anymore. Like, we all know people are getting fired left, right, and center, but everybody is stepping aside or stepping down. Well, so this is how it goes. With, with family. With, this is how it goes with all of these companies. And, you know, uh, I just finished reading, I was saying this before we started, but I just finished reading Hatching Twitter, which is uh, Nick Bilton's of the New York Times. He wrote a book about how Twitter was started and all of the executive drama that happened for, like, three or four years there. And, like... On the public side of things, everything is done to save the face of the executive and save the face of the company by having them say, so-and-so is stepping aside and so-and-so is stepping down. But behind the scenes, it's like screaming in boardrooms and definite firings and things like that. But, you know, they always seem to give the... Uh, unless in, like, very rare circumstances where, like, uh, somebody, you know, legitimately gets fired for being violent. I, I don't know. But it's always it's always made to seem like they stepped down or stepped aside or pursuing other interests or will be spending more time with their family or some other innocuous thing that that lets them save their their face for when they get hired on the, the next. Well, and I think a lot of that is, is tired. Is. I think yeah. a, a lot. I think a lot of that is tied to uh, you know the departure package. Um, yeah. The Louis Vuitton golden parachute. Exactly. Uh, uh, a good example is um, Sanofsky, when he left Microsoft, I think this actually came out in some SEC filing that Microsoft had to make where they disclosed that he was under, you know, an NDA for some period of time where he, and he couldn't disparage Microsoft publicly, um, and in return he got some ridiculous amount of money. And, you know, me personally, if you give me, you know, Ten million dollars to uh, to not say anything negative about an employer that I feel uh, treated me poorly. I think that's an offer that I would probably take. Um, you know, I actually I actually have a really awesome troll idea right here, which is that each one of these executives, as part of the golden parachute, should get one of these Porsche design blackberries. <laughs> nice. <laughs> To be like, we're gonna recompense you with loads and loads of money in the form of Porsche design blackberries. Yeah, instead of giving ten million dollars, they get five hundred Porsche design blackberries. <laughs> Eat a bone. That would I be would a also good like troll. to see how long we can last without acknowledging Dieter trolling us. <laughs> Wait, is 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 Dieter in the hangout? Dieter is present, but but he he's uh, he's occupied right now. He's occupado. Um, so that doesn't mean he's not present and his heart's not with us. Um, yes. Isn't occupado like Spanish for the bathroom is in use? That's just yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> that's just that's just occupied. <laughs> you're you're saying that Dieter is is going to the bathroom right now. Dieter it's, is going to the bathroom right now. The bathroom is in use. Yes, this is the this is the micro studio slash bathroom. It's oh, a really no. weird place to, to broadcast. But <laughs> what okay. is he doing? 
listen. Uh, if you're if you're watching the video uh, of this, I, I apologize, and if you're listening to the the audio of this, I also apologize. I now have two <laughs> Vlads. Hey, does anyone hey. else have two Vlads? I, I, I have the real two ones. I've got two Vlads. <laughs> And the real one, there is probably a remnant one of me left over because his Google Hangout ha- hates me, uh, but I'm not giving up. I'm just going to keep coming back and multiplying until it lets me stay. Yes. Yeah, awesome, guys. Uh, okay, so I've had enough talking about BlackBerry. So apparently the FCC has allowed... It's, a, it's already allowed gadgets in the first 10,000 feet of a flight. And now it's considering allowing phone calls, uh, which is apparently... uh, Well, not apparently. This is actually my worst nightmare ever. Um, uh, But it's up to the uh, airlines, right, if they want to allow um, passengers to make phone calls while they're on a plane. So here's my thought. Why is everybody so outraged about that? So here's my thought on this. The FCC... um, The FCC. Yeah, the FCC, they they gave us one. You can use your devices on planes now, but you're going to suffer through the phone calls of every other passenger. It's equivalent exchange. Vlad, if you've ever been trapped on a train with somebody who's, like, gabbing on the phone the entire time and you can't get away from it, uh, that's what's wrong with it. Just just magnify that on a plane. All right, fair enough. There's a problem, but that is entirely a social problem. That is not a technological problem whatsoever. That basically tells you you need to sort out your culture and your fellow Matt, right? So the next time you're stuck with somebody on the train and they're gabbing on and on, what you want to apply is a very subtle, very proportionate bit of violence so that they know not to do that. And from there, you evolve your society, you evolve your culture, and things improve. Don't hold technology back just because you're kind of evil and weird and inconsiderate. Well, I, I mean, I, I don't think that's holding technology back. The technology is there to do it now. It's just not allowed by regulations, and the FCC is considering allowing it and letting airlines decide whether they will allow it on their planes or not. So, I mean, well, that's what the I'm technology saying. The is already moved on. The regulation is holding the technical thing back, which is, you know, saying don't do... Well, I don't know. It's holding people back from doing the technical thing, I guess. But but still, I feel, I feel like if we were just a bit more considerate, this is a bonus and a positive thing for people. Like, if you're on a plane and there actually is some sort of real emergency, I mean, um, you know, let's let's not get into, like, the terrorist situations or whatever, but when you look at documentaries, people try to leave uh, messages for their loved ones and whatnot, and, I don't know, I mean, in those circumstances, it's kind of a useful thing, and in, in more innocuous ones as well. I just think if we annoy one another, that's a social problem, and we shouldn't be regulating that out of the way. We should be more considerate as society. <clears throat> well, the silver lining here is that while it may be you know, permissible from a regulatory standpoint, the, the airlines do have the option to just tell you to, uh, please, please um, don't use well, your the, phone. The, it's, like the a, point... it's like a movie theater. You can still use your phone in a movie theater. You just really shouldn't. No, no, they'll kick you out of the movie theater. They like can't like open the door. <laughs> <laughs> well, they could. That's regrettable. Uh, that would just be. That would be uh, a really. I mean, that's like a pretty severe penalty for using your phone. <laughs> um, uh, so the the point that's been made to me in the past, and this is a very fair point, is that uh, until relatively recently um, you could make calls on planes using air I think it was air, called Aircell um, which was later purchased by Verizon and that spectrum that was used for that service I believe is what eventually became GoGo um, so GoGo's uh, data service is terrestrial based they just use their own set of cell towers that are pointed upward instead of uh, laterally um, and that's how you get uh, Wi-Fi in your plane right now, um, but this service already effectively already existed, and and no one ever used those phones, which is why the Spectrum was sold off. And part of that was that it was just a very very expensive service. I'm sure that lots of people would have liked to call their family and friends and say, "Hey, I'm calling you from thirty thousand feet," but it was like ten dollars a minute or something. So if they, you know, totally I, I could see a situation where. 
the airlines do allow it, but say, you know, we're, we're going to put just a ridiculous price on it. And so, you know, if you make need to make an emergency call, some business-related thing that needs to happen right now, you can do it. It's just going to cost you an arm and a leg, and that's going to keep the riffraff off their phones. Um, I, I, I mean, like, thinking back over my lifetime, and all the plane rides I've been on, um, back when Aerosol existed, I never saw a single person use any of those phones. So if they can just price it as as poorly as they priced Aerosol, that'll keep people off their phones. But then there's another point, which is, like... If I'm in one of those situations, my first port of call might actually be Skype using an internet connection. Boom. Right. So if you, if you have Wi-Fi on the flight already, you can you can. But they block they block VoIP over. Uh, yeah. Like airline they, Wi-Fi has VoIP blocked almost universally. They block all streaming pretty much. Uh, and I mean the the bandwidth is so terrible that. You okay. Can't so they those. block streaming. I don't know. If, I don't know about that. I see people constantly sucking down massive Netflix. Quantities of data. Who who is watching Netflix on a plane? Like what what magical aircraft have you been everyone on? Everyone is what. <laughs> everyone is trying to use Netflix on a plane. Okay. Not successfully. I guarantee you, they're not doing it successfully. There are a lot of people who buy movies ahead of time on their iPad or iPhone or whatever, and then watch yeah. it on the plane. But they're not streaming Netflix. Wait, I'm promise. sorry. I'm sorry. How do they? How do you? How do they do that? Do they use iTunes? Yeah. To purchase. DRM free music and and MP4 files? No. Wait, what are, what are you talking <laughs> I, about? I don't I don't know I don't where think, Evan is going. I don't I, <laughs> Wait, I I, re, I, I just, really want to know how Evan knows this much detail about the the type of file being played back on somebody else's tablet. Yeah, what, what's going on here, Evan? Actually, actually, this is an incredible segue to a thing that is not on our topic list, but that I am extremely passionate about and that I would love to talk about. Uh, and and before, before you do it, before you do it, I just have to s- clarify for my fellow European uh, podcast participants, because we're all participants in this. Uh, my understanding of this is basically that America is land of the free, but air of the regulated. Because all I've heard so far is, we don't do this, we don't allow that, we regulate the other. I mean, guys, this well, doesn't I mean, really fit with your whole... In, in all honesty, the airline industry is probably one of, if not the most regulated industries in the U.S. It's it's like, when you compare that to, like, the firearms industry, it's like, <laughs> complete different world. Oh, also, complete irrelevant aside, but worth mentioning, I don't think you guys have, uh, the Federal Agency for Food Safety doesn't have the right to shut down a particular production of food. I think that's done at a state level. Uh, which kind of freaked me I don't out know enough it, about our own government to say yes or no, that's true or false, but I, I wouldn't be surprised. So yeah, let, let's it, cast, this, let's US, cast yeah. this let's cast this using avocados as an example. <laughs> yeah. Say there's a there's a there's an avocado plant in, in California that's producing rancid avocados. Yeah. The F, you're saying that the FDA can't be like, yo, stop doing or no, it wouldn't be the FDA, it would be the USDA. USDA. No, the USDA can definitely do that. They can definitely shut down a yeah, factory they, that's producing rancid. Avocado. The USDA has shut down like entire tomato pipelines for salmonella before. <laughs> I, I I like the the idea of like an actual pipeline with tomatoes <laughs> going through it, <laughs> and they just like they they screw down a valve and the the tomato supply just cuts off. <laughs> it's all routed through like the USDA headquarters. Are just like well, mm-hmm. tomatoes, not today. Yep. Well, I mean, to to Chris's example about avocados, that would actually be a pretty major impact on the California uh, economy, particularly if it happens it sometime be. around the Super Bowl. It would be, Because yeah. guacamole consumption around the Super Bowl is a major deal for the U.S. economy. Okay, I, I, guess, I guess I might be spreading some misinformation, but all I know is <laughs> um, it was part of my research. When the U.S. Um, when the US was shut down, when the state things were running in like skeletal mode, uh, there was a salmonella outbreak again in California uh, with some chicken. Chicken, salmonella. Well, yeah, when the when the sense. government was shut down, uh, that was the major problem was because things like the FDA didn't have the resources available to do their job. Like they couldn't enforce their jobs and do their the uh, necessary food 
inspections and all that right, jazz right. because but, the government was while, while I was looking into that, um, I, like so, somebody pointed out that they didn't have quite as much regulatory reach and power as they really should do, even when they're fully functional. But again, um, that was like not today, so obviously it's not part of my memory. Um, and Evan, I, I would just like to point out, uh, it, I mean, you, you've been to, the post, to this podcast, you know, it's just tradition to cut off a perfect segue, but uh, now that of I've taken course. care of that, no, of course. now that I've taken care of that, please pick up the segue. Okay, so I, um, I wanted to speak a little bit about um, a recent Anantec article um, by Brian Klug, um, about removable storage and removable batteries on Android phones. Um, the one of them is very important to me. The other one I could not care less about. Um, removable batteries. I mean, we've we've talked about this before. It's really great. You can you know you you get an extra Galaxy S4 battery and you just slap it in there when you're out of when you're out of uh, juice. But Removable storage, this is something I'm very, very passionate about. In fact, it was one of the main motivating decisions of my motivating reasons for me to get a Xperia Z1. By the way, America, oh, God, it's so great. You just don't... The Z1 is the best cell phone I have ever owned in my life, okay? For example, I'm going to come back to... I'm going to come back to removable storage in just one moment. But anecdotally... Yesterday, I had this phone in the sauna for 20 minutes, 25 minutes, totally fine. Asterix, I'm not responsible if you take your phone in the sauna and it doesn't work. Then I took it in the shower, perfectly great, listened to podcasts while I was in, while I was in there. Oh, it was so good. There's no, there's Dude, no replicating. that is a lie. That is a lie. I have to dispute that because if you're in the shower, the splashing of the water actually gets in the way of listening to the podcast. Well, you don't you don't like bathe with the Z1 like as a bar of soap. Like you set it off to the side. Just, yeah, but general, still, this, is, this whole conversation is making me really uncomfortable. Okay, <laughs> like just don't take just don't take your phone into the Turkish bathhouse and you'll be fine. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Saying. Anyway. So, um, part of what Brian is saying is that there are a lot of trade offs that you that you give up for removable storage and removable batteries. Um, and one of his one of his points, uh, and that's very true. I mean, it's, uh, it's really, really true. F he makes a point about um, unibody kind of product design. And, I mean, you can fit a 3,000 milliamp battery in, you know, a space that would only allow you to get a 2,200 milliamp battery from a few generations ago with a removable back. That's very true. Um, and really, I don't miss removable batteries at all um, because I'm not really w road warrioring that hard. But um, on Android, there's there's kind of this thing that I wanted to talk about, and that is that that Android is not set up to integrate very well with external storage, and this is something that I find to just be like malarkey. Um, first and foremost, watch your language, Evan. I know. <laughs> I know. This is, a, this is a family show, Evan. I'm really Can't be throwing us, around those. Uh, those I'm taking us uh, to a dark. What, what's amusing? Seven letter words. Though, is that Evan had to build up the courage for like five minutes to call out Brian Clug. <laughs> He's just kind of dodging around the issue, dodging around the issue. And now, let's get to the meat, Evan. What, what, what is your issue? So, so, there's two things going on here, and that is a technological issue like a technological and software issue. And then there's the kind of uh, corporate strategy issue that I have with uh, Google and its control over Android and its uh, displeasure with external storage. Um, and, like, basically what it comes down to is, like, Google doesn't want you to have external storage. And Google doesn't really want you to have a very high-capacity phone. I don't want you to have external storage. That's I, a personal I, problem, and I take. I mean, think, think about that. all the horrible things you could be doing with external storage. I mean, I think the world is just better if you don't have external storage. Yeah, well, I mean, it's such a it's such a a pain in the you know what to have to hey, think the, about careful. where <laughs> yeah. to have to think about where your 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 media is going. Like, it should just be one contiguous block, and the only effective way to do that is to have it all be. I mean, this has been the Windows Phone argument too, right? Like See, they, that, they, is, 
That is not true. That is absolutely not true. Um, if you remember the original Windows phones that came, the Windows Phone Sevens. Yeah, but um, that was a, that was a nightmare. That was that was a nightmare, and and Samsung got into a world of hurt because of it. Right. Like, what do you mean? Okay, why was it a nightmare? It seems like not. It seems like the actual opposite of a nightmare, in that that was part. <laughs> a dream. That was, a dream. It was a dream. <laughs> <laughs> no, what you can do is you can absolutely um, format and and contain your storage even with on two different volumes. You can format it and either stripe it, um, or just make a two two logical drives into. Uh, one logical drive. Um, it's very possible from a software front, um, and it could be it could be integrated into Android very very easily. That does prevent you from ever taking it out. If you ever take it out, all your all your stuff gone. So, so, so then, then what that, is the what point happens. of external storage? <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I, th so, I think Evan is on the brink of like suggesting, you know, RAID storage and multiple, so, so multiple was, micro SD It can be that done. Was, it can totally the whole be done. problem that Chris just brought up with the Samsungs was that the uh, I can't even remember the name of the phone right now, but the first Samsung Windows phone had a micro SD card slot, and Omnia you put 7. your card in. And, Ooh, the Omnia and, Seven was so great. And yep. it would format it, and then you could never use that card for anything else, and it, it was like your card was just shot. Okay, so that okay, so what you're talking about is one poor implement, one poor software implementation from Samsung, and who ever heard of that? A, and B, like it can be done better, like it can absolutely be done better. And I we feel can... like this is a conversation, an argument you should have made in like 2009, man. Okay, yeah, <laughs> and, and guys, I need to I need to make a point here. Hold on, a physical point, which is um, quite aside from the really in depth and techy stuff that everyone is talking about. Micro SD cards are just tiny, and I'm digging around for one right now, and I can't find it. <clears throat> and the thing is, I can get behind the whole. Let's have removable storage. Let's have like I have one card with all of my movies on it. I have one, another card with like my dubstep albums on it, and such and such. And if we do a really good implementation, one whole if, card just for your dubstep. <laughs> Dude, Sixty-four of gigs of dubstep, <laughs> at least. You, you can't, you can't and, live and with it's that. Really, it's only like this. Okay. <laughs> I three, will three songs on one card. Okay, nope. SIM card adapters. I have... A are, you really, are you really struggling to find your SIM so card right now? I'm right, holding here, one up here, to here, my here, camera. Here we go, here we go. Here we go, see? Okay. There. Yeah, there we go. I mean, look at how freaking tiny these things are. I mean, the best... The most common thing people do with them is lose them when they're not in the phone. So, that this is my issue. That works out disk. Uh, yeah, but we, we I don't own any stock in SanDisk, so I can keep going. Um, well, listen, so basically the point I want to make... I, I was just trying to make my point, man. Let me, let me just finish it quickly. Do it. It's, it's very brief. It's removable media made sense back in the day when removable media was something you could grasp, like, you know, something you could handle, uh, a cartridge. Like uh, a CF. A mini disc, or whatever. Right, a CF, yeah, perfect example. What is this freaking tiny... It's it just way too easy to lose. So the removable aspect actually uh, just becomes a pain and a chore. Uh, I mean, that is true. That is very true. And really, like, once you put in your micro SD card, it's kind of just, like, in there. And uh, I don't know very many people that are, like, actively swapping. Like, I take so many pictures, then I have to swap to the next card so I can blast through 3,000 more 8 megapixel. If, if you know pictures. one of those people, I would like to know them too. Well, I mean, I mean, there's lots of people that fill up their phones with pictures all day long. Uh, you know, my wife does that all the time. But uh, I think, you know, I understand what you're saying, Evan. Uh, but I think that uh, external storage is really not going to come back outside of the world of Samsung anytime soon. Uh, what I do wish would happen is I wish that manufacturers, especially manufacturers like Apple, would not charge such a huge premium to get a decent amount of storage built into the device. Well, uh, so here's here's what I would... It doesn't cost would... $100 to put 16 gigs more storage yep. in. It costs like $3.12. So it's like the, the, the difference in price between a, a, a base level iPhone and an iPhone that's like got a usable amount of storage is like ridiculous. The same can be said for the iPads. I mean, it's very true. And but here's here's my like real kind of larger problem with this is that 
you know, the first, when you talk about removable storage on Android, the first thing people come back with is, well, I mean, phones come with 32 gigs now. Phones come with 64 gigs, you know, storage, um, or an option that you can get. It is super expensive, but... Oh, and Evan froze. Evan. Uh, he can't make his point. Poor Evan. Well, he, he, he's <laughs> about Android phones are on Google Hangout. What do you expect? <laughs> yeah. Google shut down that conversation. Uh, so let's let's move on. Um, Bro, actually, before we do... It's really anticlimactic <laughs> end to that rant, but okay. Before we do, let me actually squeeze in an extra rant, which is on uh, the SIM extractor tool. So, I've, like... In looking for the micro SD card, I dug up all of mine, and like I say, I've got like two dozen of them. And the one on the Nexus one right Five, here. the this one on Nexus one. Five is really, really tiny. Hello. Hey, Evan. Sorry um, about that. And it, and it's really skinny. And actually, using the LG G2 SIM extraction tool on the Nexus Five, it's too thick. Um, I find quite a lot of them are actually too thick. Then there's this Nokia one, which is like really shallow and bent at this point, uh, which doesn't get deep enough on some phones. And this is the thing I discovered that there's actually fragmentation in SIM extraction tools. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I discovered this. I, I discovered this exact issue last year with the Nexus Four because the right. the Nexus Four has a really tiny SIM slot hole, and so, I couldn't. So normally, I, 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 I've always kept a a, a, a Nokia pin on my keychain at all yep. times for this exact reason and mm -hmm. you, I couldn't I couldn't fit it into the Nexus 4. I carry around this bent paper clip uh, because I can never manage to hang on to SIM uh, extracting tools and this works for like 95% of phones except for the stupid Nexus 5 and even sometimes the Nexus 4 because it's literally this tiny little thing is too thick to fit in the Nexus 5 yeah. slot. Uh, so yeah. Fragmentation man. And, and weirdly enough, I, I'm, I'm with Chris on this one. I think Nokia and uh, Apple make the best SIM extraction tools, if anybody cares. <laughs> and, and Evan is so, you know, dismissive of this entire conversation, he left us again. <laughs> what, what they Wait, really do, that, do, do... Do iPhones even come with a SIM extraction tool? I, Not I, anymore. They used to, right? At one uh, time, maybe? I don't know. Oh, they, they must... Well, what are you talking about? They must do. I don't think No, because do the anymore. SIM is already in the phone when you buy it. Yeah. Career. Well, for you guys, I, I get Although, a lot of iPhones. Yeah, I was going to say, Apple is selling um, a SIM-free phone now. This just happened in, like, the past week. They started stocking the SIM-free phones in U.S. stores. So, they, I mean, yeah, they must include a tool with those, I guess. But I'm 99% sure there wasn't one in my box. Yeah, I don't think there is uh, in, in most retail boxes. I think that... Uh, Apple just expects you to either have one if you're looking for one, or their Apple Store employees will handle the SIM swap. Hey, keep in mind, this is the company that's been trying for at least two and a half or three years now to move to embedded SIMs. So it's little surprise that they would make the SIM as difficult to get to as possible. I have returned. <laughs> we'll see how long this one lasts. Yes, yes. Wait, can someone, uh, can someone catch me up? You're really talking about SIM extraction tools right now? Yes. Which I'm sure you have some strong thoughts on, Evan. I have uh, no. Th I don't. I mean, it's whatever. I keep it. I keep a Nokia and an Apple one on my keychain. Both. Yes. But aren't they interchangeable? The problem is the LG. No, the one. Nexus. The Nexus Five. Or you need to have a super thin one, like the Nokia one that comes with the Lumia 1020, to get into phones like. No, my Nokia one is way too thick for LG phones. Blech, sorry, man. That sounds like a personal problem. I still haven't. Um, I still haven't bought an Nexus Five. Should I buy an Nexus Five? Absolutely uh, no, no. Because are you out you, of your you mind? You missed your opportunity to spend eight hundred dollars on it from Best Buy, uh, <laughs> and now you would have to buy it for a reasonable three hundred and fifty dollars. So I don't see why you would purchase one. I still like the Nexus Four. I don't know. No, so that's not a bad thought. You yeah, can buy my Nexus. There's a good Nexus reason why you should buy the Nexus Four. Uh, but but Evan, I'm on tenderhooks. Do you want to wrap up the micro SD point here? Yeah yeah yeah, I totally do. I totally do. So in America, um, you know, all of the flagship phones pretty much come with uh, 32 and 64 gig options, minus the um, carrier Galaxy S4s. But if you um, if you know if you want something cheaper and you're buying phones off contract, it's really hard to find uh, storage options. Um, the HTC One Mini is a good example. Like that only comes in 16 gigs, uh, and a lot of lower-end phones, 
either lower end phones either have removable storage to keep this the costs really low and those are like true low cost devices or smaller phones that you would imagine to be uh, a little bit lower cost um, they really only come with 16 gig options and if you're like most people I would imagine if you have constant access to LTE LTE then you're great you can you know you can use all of Google services and you can contribute to their data sets and that is super fine and peachy but if you live internationally and a you don't have access to Google Music or some of the streaming options that are available in America then you know you're screwed you get 16 gigs and that's all you can get um, wow and... so the rest of us outside of America are just completely off the web as far as you're concerned as far as what's concerned? We need our storage because we have no web services whatsoever. Spotify just popped up in the States one day. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> there's, there's, no, there's no wireless outside the U.S. Did, no, there's, did, there's no didn't, didn't Al Gore invent Spotify? Yes. I'm pretty sure <laughs> oh, that's a firm fact. Yeah. They're still communicating by a carrier pigeon in the U.K. I mean... Uh, okay. When we can, because the other thing is we also don't have any uh, food infrastructure, so we kind of tend to eat our pigeons, particularly here. <laughs> uh, there's there's a really good joke about terrible English food in there, but I'm going to leave it alone. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> you do know that actually um, one of the famous curries is invented in Birmingham in the UK, the Bounty Curry. So uh, there you go. But what does that have to do with LTE? <laughs> it has to do with food. It takes up so much longer to order it. Yeah, it's true. All right, so you guys want to talk about Windows Phone? Instagram. Let's yes. do that. Let's do that. So uh, last week, Instagram finally came to Windows Phone in a official capacity. Uh, and there was a bit of uh, confusion initially about how the app actually worked, but it turns out you can indeed take photos with the Instagram app on on Microsoft or on Windows Phone, uh, but you can't record videos, which is kind of a bummer and kind of a pretty big feature for Instagram these days. Yeah, it's it's a... The whole thing was just a, a train wreck from beginning to end. So they actually... Instagram was telling outlets, including us, that um, that you could not take photos from within the app. And that's still, like, technically, that technically true? true. Yeah, because you, you go to the you go to the camera roll and then you can take a photo from there. But, like, why would you mince words <laughs> against your product? <laughs> like, go ahead and, you know, just take the, take the mulligan and say, yes, you can take photos with the app. Because in reality, you can. It's just on a technicality, you have to go outside the app to do it, but it's still from within the app. So it's... It, it was really weird. Um, yeah, it's a different order of, of things than, say, like on Android or iOS, where you, you get to, like, take your photo uh, immediately. But it's, I mean, at the right. end of the day, you can still open it's up the app, so, hit a button, and take photos. It's just so funny that that was the kind of turn of events, because this is such a, you know, an anticipated moment for Windows Phone, and then it just gets immediately so weird. Trashed. And uh, even so, though, you still can't do video recording with it. So... They're not at feature parity, um, and it, it seems like it seems like there was some rush imposed, most likely by Microsoft, to get this product out of the door, probably in time for the holidays, because Instagram is such a big name and was the you know the most important remaining hole in their app lineup. Um, but it's it's kind of a hollow victory because they they didn't close the gap. Um, completely. Um, they, they wanted the name without regard for making sure that the app was every bit as, as, as good as it is on other platforms. And then, of course, there's the ongoing issue. And, and Tom, Tom Warren pointed this out in um, a report that he did on, quote-unquote, closing the app gap, that um, once the app is launched, be it Instagram, be it Vine, be it Twitter, whatever, um, none of these developers are as committed to keeping those apps updated on Windows Phone as they are on Android and iOS for good reason, because they have a tenth of the users. So there's not, you know, the impetus and the incentive to keep those users happy isn't as strong mathematically as it is on, on other platforms, and that is going to be an ongoing challenge for I mean, we, uh, we even see this with Android. Android... You know, they might Android might have all of the the same big name apps as iOS, but when new features come out, 
they come to iOS first and then maybe yep. months later show up on Android. Uh, right. I think Instagram's been pretty good about keeping its Android app sort of concurrent with, with the iOS one, but there's still some things that it's missing. Uh, and, you know, other apps are, are, are much worse offenders where it'll be a long time between the, the, the feature parity. So it's, it's, you could just, like, magnify that for Windows Phone. Uh, and, you know, we've seen that with uh, the, just an example is, like, the official Twitter app. Uh, the, the official Twitter apps on, I, on iOS and Android generally get updated the same day. They're the same day, they get the same new features, and then months and months later, they'll come to Windows Phone. I think it was just recently updated to let you set get alerts when somebody tweets. So now you can finally get, like, mobile alerts uh, through the app when you set, say, so when uh, Barack Obama tweets or whatever. Um, it'll alert you through the app, which the Android and iOS have had for a long, long time. And, well, and of course, the other problem is that they're, they're still Microsoft is still chasing these big name apps that are already out. But when new, like really buzzworthy apps right. come out, and the example that I used on Twitter when I was talking about this last week is Quizza, uh, which is a really hot app for iOS right now. Um, that won't come out for Windows Phone for months, if ever. I don't like. I don't know if QuizUp has plans to launch on Windows Phone. Although you probably don't want to download it right now anyway, with the privacy <laughs> issues. But yep. I, I, regardless, the point is there. You know, these these uh, the the developers that are trying to get these new apps off the ground naturally choose uh, iOS and to some extent Android. Um, on day one, Rim Capsule is another example of a, you know, a huge uh, Temple, app. That, Temple Run Two. Uh, Temple Run Two. Know, uh, with the, the biggest to the incentives. Go ahead, Dan. Well, the, the 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 biggest one that's that's the most amusing to me is uh, Mirror's Edge, which is is now available on Windows Phone. It came out, I believe, or less this past summer. Uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that debuted with the iPhone 4 uh, in 2010 on iOS, and it was either uh, early 2013 or middle 2013 when it got to Windows Phone, which is like. Vlad, what were you going to say about incentives? Well, I'm about to say it. Um, <laughs> wait, wait. To, to Chris's Please point. Go. Okay. <laughs> Are we done here? <laughs> uh, but, but to Chris's point, he, he was talking about incentives and um, you know why developers would keep the development part going. And I think we all know, even though it hasn't been official, uh, that Instagram coming to Windows Phone was incentivized by big piles of cash from Microsoft. Right. <laughs> That's pretty much a given. But that payment most likely related to just bring Instagram to Windows Phone, like that sentence. And from both perspectives, you can see the strategic advantage. It's about the conversation on the bus where two guys are talking trash about, well, I've got my Windows Phone, and I've got my iPhone, and yeah, but mine has the apps, and then you know, they start comparing which apps, which platform has, etc. because that's actually happening now in real uh, conversations between real people. Um, and you can say, I've got Instagram and Windows Phone. Even if it doesn't have proper feature parity, it's there. So the strategic advantage for Microsoft is there. It's for, and you can justify why Microsoft has pushed so hard to get the app onto its platform. But Chris identifies a real big issue, which is what happens after version 1.0. Because with the iPhone, what keeps happening is Here's our iOS 7 update, and then two days later, here's our iOS 7 update with a few fixes, now that we've seen uh, a few errors and whatever. It's just really instant, and there's responsiveness, and people are working to evolve and improve the app. And what I'm noticing happening is, with Android just becoming uh, a stronger and more prevalent platform, a lot of the developers are also using Android phones. So they have that kind of unprompted stimulus to keep developing their app on a different platform than iOS. Everybody knows that iOS is the one that you make the most money on. Uh, it's the one that makes the most sense to develop for as a developer. But if you yourself use Android, like, like me, for example, like I can't use an iPhone anymore because I'm so addicted to the Android Gmail application. So if you're stuck with Android for whatever reason, and you're a <laughs> developer of... of <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm stuck with Android for a very positive and a happy reason. I'm not complaining here. I think it's, <laughs> for me, for my users, it's more useful than the iPhone because they also don't screw around with privacy invading apps like QuizUp. Thank you for the challenge, by the way, Chris. Um, but yeah, that being the case, that's a little advantage for people. If people are using your 
operating system, it encourages them to keep developing for it and developing promptly for it. Uh, so it, it kind of comes down to, is Windows Phone uh, an attractive si operating system for people to use? It just comes back to the basics there. Yeah, I mean, really, this is the same old story that we, we've had since, since Windows Phone came out. Uh, it, it does seem like, you know, they are getting more and more of the apps that we've been looking for in addition to Instagram. Vine is now available. Uh, the same day that Instagram came out, Waze came out, uh, which I'm not sure why you'd use Waze, but it's out. Uh, <laughs> and, and there are other big name apps that have come along. You know, they, they now have Pandora and PayPal and, and all these other uh, apps that, that were well, missing for a long time. But to be clear, Waze is like the Netflix of of navigation apps. Like their their sole goal is to be on every platform imaginable. So it's like to an extent, I'm like you know when when I hear that Waze comes to Windows Phone, I don't think that's in, that's actually indicative of any trend. Well, the only thing that's really interesting about Waze coming to interest uh, to Windows Phone, to me at least, is the fact that uh, Waze is now own, owned by Google uh, and Google has pretty much said that we're not really developing for Windows Phone until it gets more right. popular. Well, part of Waze's whole deal is uh, just acquiring massive quantities of traffic data. So, I mean, maybe that's Google's play, or Waze's play. It's like, well, you know, maybe nobody will use it, but we'll still be able to suck down a bunch of traffic and, uh, you know, public transit data. Well, I, I talked to Tom a little bit about that, and his theory, and I think this is probably a reasonable one, is that they had Windows Phone on their roadmap prior to the Google acquisition. Right. Mm. So, it, you know, and, and, and Google, as we've seen from Motorola, has a habit of running some of its acquisitions as independent companies anyway. I don't know if that's the case with Waze or not, but um, they do still identify as Waze, not as Google, I think. Yeah. So here's one other question I actually have about Windows Phone. Now that the Xbox One uh, has happened... Um, First of all, are any of you guys buying? Have you obtained an Xbox One yet? Yes. Yes. Okay. Chris. Do you care about the uh, synergies that things like Xbox Smart Glass and whatever other company apps Microsoft does, do you care about those things? I, I use Smart Glass quite a bit, but only because uh, the Xbox One's um, control... Like, AV control environment slash ecosystem is a, just a, an enormous bag of hurt, as Neli ha did a pretty good job of laying out in his report um, a few weeks ago. So having Smart Glass as a tool to help control that uh, is a good thing. Um, but what do you use it on, Chris? Uh, oh, uh, on my iPhone. Yeah, so, so the thing <laughs> is, like, there's no, there's no reason for you to buy a Windows phone uh, in order to use your Xbox, you don't. You don't. Do you gain anything by having Microsoft's own phone? Yeah, platform that was my question. To Microsoft's gaming system, and the, and I think the answer is going to be no, because Microsoft was wise enough to realize that we need to release this app on Android and iOS because that's where the users are. Right. It, it's funny going all the way back to Windows Phone Seven. Uh, Microsoft had made such big, big promises about Xbox Live integration, and none of that really materialized. Right. Well, like it, one one it, thing has. There's a there's a Halo game on on Windows Phone, and you can't get that on Android or iOS. So if you really want to play Halo, yeah, well, and you <laughs> you know you can see your your avatar and your your gamer points and all that nonsense. But it's not like it's it, it's nothing like. I mean, if Microsoft had been really smart in that regard, they would have done something similar well, to what Sony is doing with Vita and Remote Play. It's, and it's, and they, they never did that. What's really interesting to me is, like, this kind of goes to Microsoft's play on it, all of its platforms. They all look very similar now. Even the, the Xbox dashboard looks very much like Windows 8, which looks very much like Windows Phone 8. But the Xbox dashboard doesn't really talk to Windows 8, and Windows 8 doesn't talk to Windows Phone 8. And it's like, they have all of these products that look very similar and maybe function very similarly, but there's no benefit to you to have a Windows Phone 8 and a Windows 8 tablet at the same yeah. time. Like, you can't share your apps. Uh, your data might be shared over through the cloud, but, you know, if I'm storing stuff in SkyDrive, it can also access SkyDrive on my Mac, and I can access SkyDrive on an iPad, and et cetera, et cetera. So it's like, there seems like there's some sort of opportunities that are not being taken advantage of, at least not yet. 
Right. Well, talking about uh, incentives, like if if Microsoft can't incentivize developers, you know, on a massive scale to develop apps for their platform, um, perhaps they can uh, incentivize consumers with uh, tighter integration between their three platforms. Exactly. Like, I mean, if if like if I'm playing, like if I'm doing something, and I just want to like share data between my Windows 8 tablet and my Windows Phone 8. Uh, or you know, share an app across them, or something like that. Like that, that kind of makes sense. Uh, but it's not happening. Not now, at least. Uh, well, let, let, let's just point out the fact that nobody is really doing that beautiful integration across devices. Uh, well, no, the iPad well. and the iPhone. Uh, I can buy an i uh, an app on my iPad, and I can use it on my iPhone if it's a universal app and vice versa. Yeah, but it, but it's incomplete. It's incomplete, is what I'm saying. So yeah, there, there are some strengths, but for example. Uh, if you go and try to rely on iCloud, uh, you quickly realize that uh, Google services are so much superior. What are you talking about? Okay, and, and the other thing is, I work for iCloud is just a joke. It's like some kid trying to copy uh, Google Docs. It's it's terrible. It's it's so far from being useful. Um, but yeah, I mean. My, in my experience, again, I find the most useful implementation to be Google's. So I can mess around with some notes on my phone on Google Drive and then jump on, onto my uh, Chrome on my desktop and the notes are there and things like that. Um, but it's still really rudimentary. It's still a sort wow. of thing where you feel like you're just getting some basic sync between uh, your devices and that's it. Whereas I think the vision that Chris had as well uh, with the initial introduction of Windows Phone was something like, perfect example for me is the Xbox Live Arcade, right? So those are lighter games, simpler games, ones that don't require as much storage. If you could just, you know, bring that onto the phone and have games like Braid and whatever just accessible on your phone, it opens up so many more possibilities. And and it, it frustrates me as well when guys at Microsoft promise things like, well, we now have DirectX compatibility in uh, Windows Phone 8. And I keep waiting, OK? We have DirectX compatibility. Now, where are the more advanced games? Where is this awesomeness that I can't get on the other platforms? And that's what keeps missing. I mean, that's the story of every build conference you know, for the last couple of years. Um, I mean, you guys remember that, that demonstration where they showed an, uh, a game being played on a, a Windows 8 machine at the initial Windows 8 build conference, and then, you know, kind of seamlessly transitioning over to continuing the game on the subway. But those kind of features, like, never really materialized. And, you know, we're still waiting for them. Now, Chris, let me ask you this. Have you tried using um, the Xbox One SkyDrive integration for game streaming? No. So from what I understand, you can uh, record, you can use the, like, five-minute DVR uh, feature of the Xbox One to mm -hmm. record five minutes of gameplay, and then I think that you can uh, have that automatically deposit that five minutes into SkyDrive, and I think there's pretty tight integration with Facebook, so you can very seamlessly post those game those game trailers to or no, uh, those game that gameplay footage directly onto Facebook. So like these little integrations are like starting to make their way, but I think what we're all realizing at this point is that it's like really hard and that's why no one is really doing it but I mean Microsoft is at least trying yeah well, Microsoft I use, isn't alone in, in, Sorry, in, well I was just gonna say I use uh, I use uh, so the Xbox one is a built-in video sharing service called upload um, and you can choose like when you save a, a video clip you can choose to save it to upload or to SkyDrive uh, and I, I, I don't think I've ever opened SkyDrive in my life, at least not intentionally. So I just, I'm using the upload service. Dude, SkyDrive is good. Don't hate SkyDrive. Yeah, SkyDrive is actually uh, one of the better uh, cloud backup Also, uh, if you're listening to this podcast like two months from now, maybe in 2014 or at some point, we'll probably be talking about a new service, whatever the new name is, right? Because they renamed it SkyDrive. Oh, um, right, right. Uh, but yeah, just to just to add to the point, Microsoft isn't alone in capturing these gameplay footage things. Uh, Sony did a whole extra hardware layer so we can do uh, game recording in the PS4, which to me I, is 
I am totally not a gamer, and I, I'm, like, a self-proclaimed not a gamer, uh, but there's just, like, I just cannot grasp the appeal of watching somebody else's yeah. recorded gameplay footage. Like, no, I know it's I, huge, I and there's, like, millions of people that use this Twitch service and things like that, but I'm like, well, why would I want to watch some guy running around through uh, whatever game it is? Uh, but uh, there's reasons. There's reasons, uh, particularly for, like, guides, if you're struggling with overcoming a, bo- a particular boss fight or whatever else. And, like, um, hyper-competitive gaming. Like, StarCraft is huge because yeah. people want to see other people's strategies, and it's, like, a big deal. Well, I uploaded a sweet video of me doing donuts in a, <laughs> in a 1991 GMC Typhoon. Uh, or Cyclone, excuse me. So, I, like, I don't know what you guys are talking about. Like, why people wouldn't want to see that, I don't know. That's but, 15 seconds of your life well spent. But that's the thing. I, I think I'm totally involved with Dan. What I am... The opposite of that, insofar as games have done more for my upbringing than proper education has, uh, but I, I don't I don't get the appeal of particularly like streaming your gaming session and like not doing something clearly focused, such as a guide or such as uh, Chris is showing off and whatever else. I've already um, watched I've watched Tom Warren uh, successfully defend his his goal in uh, in uh, FIFA 14. So, I mean. I, I like. I'm all about it. I every time I see one of my friends upload a video, I'm I'm all up on it. I love it. But it's it's just so wrong. And okay. But also to mention on the PC, Nvidia has this shadow play feature, which a lot of people are quite enthusiastic about. Um, which pretty much does the same thing. I'm I'm just trying to convey the idea that everybody seems to be getting on board with it. Uh, and Dan and I completely don't get it. Chris is being a troll right now. But, I mean, particularly with games, if you're going to show off video of it, you're really just showing off your experience of the same thing that other people are most likely going to experience as well. It's kind of like, um, yeah, uh, bring well, it back to... Like, it's, but it's, it's no different than wanting to watch a replay of, like, a really good... Uh, you know, touchdown in a football game. Like there, there are there are epic moments in games that are that have entertainment value. Like yeah, you know, a, a a good a good overtake in in a, a a heated Forza match. I'll watch that. Yeah, no, that's valid. That's valid. I, I'm not going to argue with that. I I like. I guess the thing is with games, most of the time you don't have these highlight things. So right. I guess. Uh, if you're being selective and just uploading the particularly juicy bits, then I can get behind that. But also, since, since we're on the, on this topic, very briefly, I would just like to point out this entire hoopla around the new consoles is completely premature. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, nobody should care until Titanfall shows up on the Xbox One and just kind of blows us all away. Uh, n- these consoles don't have that amazing game which is going to keep you locked in next to your TV throughout the holiday season, which I think is, you know, the hallmark of a good console launch. And if you want the absolute prettiest and best graphics, you still have to go to the PC and play Battlefield 4, which looks stunning. Like, get a good graphics card, play Battlefield 4 on ultra settings, it will make you forget about the consoles, seriously. Um, but um, there's also the other proviso slash caveat that Battlefield 4, its gameplay is actually, like, stupid. <laughs> horribly, horribly stupid. Um, I haven't gotten into the multiplayer, but the single-player missions are just lame. It's, it's, it's exactly like the stunning supermodel uh, stereotype. Amazing to look at, completely dumb and hollow on the inside. <laughs> I just need to get that on my chest. So, uh, kind of going back to to this uh, integration and consumer incentivizing thing, really quick, Chris, have you you can you could you watch your friends, uh, like DVR or live streamed uh, footage on Smart Glass? On Smart Glass, I don't think so, but uh, there are, you you know, like third party apps can integrate with with Smart Glass, mm-hmm. I think, and. Uh, the Xbox One ships with Twitch. Yeah. Um, so there might be some integration point there. I don't know. I don't use Twitch, and I don't have Twitch installed on the Xbox, but it's it's possible. Okay. 
Well, I'm just trying to figure out which is like who has the tighter like the tighter app integration because the PlayStation app just came out um, the other day, and it will allow you to throw to UStream. Uh, but but aside from that, like aside from the Smart Glass app, I'm really at a loss to to kind of underst- understand who is who is integrating better. Because Microsoft has the advantage, I would I would think, because the design language between Windows Phone and the Xbox like UI and uh, the Windows 8 UI is like very contiguous. It feels very cohes- cohesive, um, and Sony's kind of trying to deal with their own closed ecosystem, but also Android. And but I mean, the PlayStation app will let you well, you know will let you see what you're what your friends are playing, and it'll let you buy games right from the app. Well, I, I, agree with you. I, I, I agree with you that there's design synergy between the Xbox One and uh, Windows 8 and Windows Phone, but I don't think that any human being on the planet with an Xbox One is saying, ooh, I like this UI, I'm going to go buy a Windows Phone now. Like, that, yeah. that's, not, that's not happening. Hmm. I, I just need to call out Evan on his use of contiguous. It was misused. I apologize. You've been docked one point. <laughs> so, uh, if you guys don't mind, let's let's move on. <laughs> I've got a question, uh, and this as I, is as I fall on my face through this transition. This this is on topic. Um, I've ju- I just uh, let me just make sure this isn't an embargo. I got an email from Best Buy. They got two special offers launching tomorrow. If it's an embargo, whatever. <laughs> it's not like anybody listens to this podcast. <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, okay, they've got a free Samsung Galaxy S4 deal with a two-year activation of Best Buy and Best Buy Mobile Special Stores starting Wednesday through Saturday. Do you guys think the Galaxy S4 is worth buying at this point? I'm curious. What was the deal? I wasn't listening. It's a free Galaxy S4 with a two-year contract. Presumably that's a, better, a, that's a better deal than pretty much any any of the carriers are offering on the Galaxy S4. I mean, I think that the, 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 this is Best through Buy. Best Buy, so whatever carriers Best Buy offers. But you know, the uh, I think the Galaxy S4 is very much like the iPhone in that, you know, Samsung will release it in June or whatever. It's going to be a competitive device through to almost right up until the next June when the next model comes out. Uh, you know, if you look at the actual specifications of it, it's got a, you know, powerful processor, really high-res screen, a good camera and everything like that. So if you liked the Galaxy S4 six months ago, there's no reason not to like it now. You know what else it has? Removable storage. The the Galaxy S5 is going to be curved, isn't it? (laughs) No. (laughs) No. Um, Actually, uh, on that topic, uh, there has been a couple of stories coming out of Korea saying that uh, the first generation of um, uh, flexible screen devices are flopping. Now, the reason we didn't cover that is because they seem to be very flaky in terms of sourcing. It's anonymous sources, and nobody sounds particularly confident about the numbers. But uh, at least also, initial how long have they been out? I mean... Well, it's been a month, over a month. Uh, but they're being sold in really limited quantities, right? I mean, like it's not yeah. like it's available all over the world. They're being sold just in Korea, I think, right? And they're being sold alongside their flat equivalents, which are presumably much cheaper in store. It's possible. It's possible. I, I'm, I'm just saying, um, again, with, with the provisos mentioned, that uh, at least the, the earliest feedback we've heard about them yeah, hasn't been that positive, which, yeah. as far as you're concerned, Chris, is a positive because it, it, it would probably put them off. I mean, the Galaxy S5, there's no chance to do it curve because they just can't do that at mass production levels, particularly the Wait. mass production levels you need. Evan, for record, uh, record the last 10 seconds of this podcast. I want to... Put that in, in Vlad's face when the Galaxy S5 is curved. <laughs> no problem. We'll have a breakout. All right, thanks. <laughs> awesome. But uh, actually, and we can turn this into a uh, pretty nice transition here, into a pretty nice segue, provided nobody interrupts me, uh, which is to say that the Google Play edition of the Galaxy S4 uh, just started getting the 4.4 KitKat update, as uh, has the HC1, which is... Yeah, a whole, a whole bunch involved. of uh, in the past week, a whole bunch of phones got it. Uh, the Nexus Four finally, the rollout started for that, uh, and I've had it on my Nexus Four for I don't know a week or so. 
Uh, and the Moto X's, uh, right now it's available from Verizon, T-Mobile, and AT&T Moto X's, uh, so it's just leaving Sprint out of the equation for there, so, uh, and then it just started yesterday, I believe, uh, the Google Play Edition, HTC One, and Galaxy S4 started getting That's right. Android 4.4, so, uh, you know, it's good to see it's making its way around, um, I doubt we're gonna hear any more about Android 4.4 KitKat rollouts um, for a while because at this point it's the carrier or the uh, manufacturer customized versions that are, are the majority of things left. So that's going to be a while before those get it. Yeah. And I still don't have it on my one either, so I'm pissed. Here's the thing. My sincerest hope about Android 4.4 is that come CES in January, nobody comes out with a phone, with an Android phone that doesn't have it. Oh my God! You are so high. They are yeah, going to be all having Android 4.3 at the best. Yeah, dude, I bet you we're at CES. We're going to see some Chinese manufacturer release a phone with Android 4.1. I guarantee it. Yeah, but but no, I there are there are not going to be any major phone announcements at CES. There aren't, but the Chinese manufacturers do announce things. Ah, uh, Chris, see see now, Evan, keep recording. Oh yeah, because <laughs> we're, oh, yeah. we're gonna we're gonna need to throw this back in Chris. You know what's gonna happen is like Sony is going to announce a phone yes. like it did last year. Yes. And, and okay. Sony yeah, and Sony, Sony yeah. is going to announce the phone with Android 4.2. Oh god, if, I can't. If Chris were only to qualify his statement to say there will not be a new phone at CES that is that launches or is available to buy before April, <laughs> then it'd be fine. But wait, so what what does Sony have in the pipeline right now? They're they have a fresh megaphone and they have a fresh flight okay, so, so the, Sony the is freshest going to something and the then freshest Sony rumors right now. That. That's why. The freshest Sony rumors on out in the Sony the Sony beat is a refreshed uh, Xperia Z1 uh, either called the Xperia Z2 or possibly the Z1S that people thought was the Z1 mini. Um, I guess that's possible. It's people are kind of not sure because this is all rumory and shady and that sort of thing. And then there's also the international uh, Xperia Z1 Mini, which please, I need to, I need one so bad. So I mean, oh, in, wait, regardless wait, of wait, what the rumors you, say, you said you had the best phone in the world. world. Well, I mean, best phone in the world right now until they come out with one that's the size for a human hand. Well, it exists. They, they've announced it for Japan, the mini version. Yes, well, Docomo, it's, I mean, it's a Docomo exclusive. There's no guarantee that the international one will ever come out. So just man up and move to Japan. It's cool. <laughs> hey, so while we're uh, deep in the Sony, uh, I'm just going to use this and steamroll this transition right into the uh, the Sony SmartWatch 2, which I, uh, I reviewed, and it went up today. And if you haven't read it, uh, go read it. Um, and I just, I'm just going to sum this up by saying that it, it breaks my heart because... The smartwatch 2 is, uh, in my opinion at least, the best-looking smartwatch we've seen, um, the one that's the least embarrassing to wear. Uh, but its software is so clunky and so difficult to use that it is uh, not worth it, and that's it's sad. It's better than the smartwatch 1 by leaps and bounds, but it is not... I, I don't even like it as much usability-wise as a Pebble, um, and, and certainly not uh, where... I would hope that a new smartwatch would be at this point. No one understands what a smartwatch should be except me. I'm literally the only human being on so, the planet. This is, this is this is where smartwatches are. Smartwatches it is. Uh, smartwatches are the 2000. Or we're in the 2005 smartphone world of smartwatches. Yes. And we're in the 2001 tablet world of tablets, and we're still a couple of years away until somebody really figures this out, and, you know, there's always, there's all this demand and all this interest and all this intrigue, and nobody seems to get it right, and then somebody's going to figure it out, and there's going to be its iPhone moment, and then, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be great, uh, and then, and then everybody will want one, but we're not there yet, and all of the, the uh, things that have been tried are, are really not, not it. But I'm convinced that's not... I see where you're going with that. I'm not convinced it's a perfect analogy because I think what makes wearables shine is when they are... are per I mean, they're things you're literally wearing like clothes and like jewelry. They need to be personalized to the person that's wearing them. Which is why, uh, gl you know, glass looks... Well, glass looks stupid on anybody, but yes. it, 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 it isn't personalized 
to the person that's wearing it, and there's been talk about well, integrating it with prescriptions. That's but part of figuring it out. I mean, maybe maybe that's what needs to be figured out yeah. to make these things successful. But they also need to figure out usability and functionality and features yep. uh, sure. that that aren't there yet. Um, right. So uh, I think and as battery far life. as with the sm- battery life. Yeah, and battery life. I was gonna say with the smartwatch too. Sony did do a number of things right. Uh, in my tests, I've got I got easily got three to four days of battery life, which is acceptable at this point for these things. Uh, and it charges over micro USB, which means it uses the same charging cable as my phone, uh, which uh, is such a stupid thing that I have to bring it up. Uh, but no other smartwatch does that, so or none other that I've used at least. So that's it's kind of a a major convenience uh, that I like that Sony did, but I can't stand using the software. Here is my contribution, uh, and it particularly goes to the software side. The Sony SmartWatch 2 is probably the saddest out-of-the-box experience that I've had with any gadget over the past however many years, two, three years, however long it's been. It's just, I pulled it out. First of all, I got that uh, metal strap on my review unit, whereas Dan got the plastic one, the silicone one. The rubber one, yeah. Rubber. Okay. Um... The metal strap, I had no idea of how to adjust it, so it was way too big, and it was cold, and it was unpleasant. Um, and, you know, my gentle, gentle wrists just weren't ready for it. But aside from that, you turn it on, you start looking inside it for things to do, and it's just so barren. It's like we have a wallpaper, we have a time app, and a timer app, and we have, like, four watch faces, and that is it. You're on your own after that. And then you have to go and search and dig and enhance the functionality and get your notifications set up and all this other baloney and nonsense, which I just wasn't even interested in doing because I don't find it that attractive. I don't like the fact that you have the free Android buttons on it. There's absolutely no reason for them to be on there. It needs to be clean, like Chris says. It needs to be something you would want to just wear for the sake of keeping time. Like, get that right first. Compete with the guys who are already doing that correctly. Yes. Um, and then yes. move on to trying to enhance things. Yes. I do not... Chris... Were you, were you picking your nose, Chris? Yeah, what, what just happened? <laughs> what, you're not familiar with this gesture? Have you that ever played gesture means in your not life? it. This means not it. That means... Yeah, like, that's, no, that's, that, that, that's that means international nose goes territory. None of you guys have played charades... This, this this means yes that's it you have it right like if you're if you're playing charades and somebody has a word right in a phrase you go like that meaning spot on I've always just I, seen people point and be like no yeah. I, yeah. you guys are if you're on if you're listening to the show right now and you're on Twitter will somebody please back me up that this means spot on Chris who plays charades we all have I trust charades. Chris I trust Chris and his <laughs> Wikipedia sources uh, I'm down with that. Listen, uh, citation needed on charades. Come on. And I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to just collect the endorsement from Chris. That, that makes my day. I'm, I'm basically. Vlad I'm gets it. What can I say? Vlad gets it. Vlad, you and I are going to kickstart a proper smartwatch. <laughs> yeah, because that's what kickstart sure. underneath. Another Maybe. smartwatch project. Yeah, but this but, one's know, going to be good. I was, I was actually thinking about that today, and it's, it's, it's kind of depressing to me when you think about. Um, the 90s, you know, the, I mean, it's going to be like the 22nd century or whatever, and I'm going to have artificial hearts and artificial everything else, uh, and I'm still going to be nostalgic about the 1990s. That was my decade. But at so that Vlad, time... So Vlad just mentioned that he's going to be alive in the 22nd century, <laughs> which is no less than 87 years away from now. <laughs> Wait, why so not? Vlad, Vlad why not? plans to be a centurion, at least. Dude, I am definitely eating the right diet for it. I'm eating enough this, cabbage to survive. Wait, this. isn't a centurion like a like a Roman warrior or something? C- are, centenarian? Are you, right. Is that what I'm trying to say? Centenarian? Maybe. Yeah, but the centurion is so much cooler, so I, I'm down with it. Um, no, but seriously, in the 90s, we had fi- we had already figured out, and even before the 90s, it's just that's my recollection, we had already figured out how to make a watch work without any extra power, right? You could just, with the movement of your hand, you could recharge a watch. That, that actually happened decades before that, but... I'm just maybe. talking about the freaking 90s, man. Whatever happened before I was born didn't happen, as far it, as I'm it, They did. They, they figured it out decades before. Maybe it trickled down to actually accessible for normals by then, but... 
Okay, listen, if the 90s Citizen, is my... Citizen has had kinetic watches since the 60s, I'm pretty sure. I didn't say we invented kinetic watches in the 1990s, so stop arguing with the point I'm not making. <laughs> like, all I'm saying is, if that's the last relatable decade for me, we have, even, we have an even younger audience. Let's not push it too far back. My point is this. We, could, we had figured out how to have a watch keep going perpetually without needing to recharge it or do any extra special effects. We had figured out how to have a contact book without requiring any power. Whereas the way we're moving now is every single one of these things that we could do mechanically uh, or in some other automatic fashion now requires power. Now we need electricity to power off just for our watch, just to keep time, just to keep, uh, you know, our contacts up to date and all of these things. And it's like we lose the tactility of having an actual nice notebook in which you keep your contacts. We lose the ability to write because we no longer need to do it. Like, can, you, can any of you remember writing, like physically writing, other than signing your signature on a bill? I take notes in a notebook all the time. Yeah, I take notes. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. You you know that. My my yeah, handwriting is horrendous, but. But I, I don't know. I, I mean, I guess I'm just kind of having one of those nostalgic uh, anti-tech moments where you you kind of think, well, why does everything need to have a freaking battery in it? Why does everything need to be powered? Whereas we figured out ways to do these things, you know, adequately already without power. You know, and and that that to me is the fundamental issue with smartwatches is. They start sucking down power. They start demanding. They start being yet another device that you need to keep recharged on a weekly basis or whatever else. Um, and like like you guys are saying, we need a really compelling feature, a real must-have additional value or benefit that makes us want to do that extra charging and that extra fuss. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that just is what makes it so hard right now because on the one hand, you want a smartwatch to have like this this great functionality right out of the box. You want it to look great. You want it to be a fantastic timepiece, um, and you also want it to you know kind of have a couple of staples of like smartness. You know you want to receive uh, notifications, and um, you want to be able to like accept and receive calls or accept and uh, deny calls from your wrist. Um, but what makes it really challenging is that. Uh, Inevitably, people will want to do so much more with it, so you have to kind of... No, not make... inevitably. This, this Samsung has put it in your head that you need to be able to do so much more with your smartwatch. You don't. No, you, no, no, you no, no, need... no. I'm not saying, like, you don't need to do more things with your smartwatch. Like, I don't want to add and remove contacts. I don't want to, like, flick through it to change music. I just want the, like... I do. I mean, you know. To each, to each their own, but like you need to at least have the capability of uh, extending the functionality to things like when I you know get in proximity of my computer, unlock it, or if yeah. if I'm in proximity of my door, you know automatically unlock that or start up my car or whatever. Well, so Motorola kind of took a baby step in that direction with its trusted Bluetooth device concept, right? Which is pretty cool. Like, I, I remember for a while, Dieter had his Pebble set up as his trusted object. Which I, I, must, I must note that you do not need a Motorola to do that. You could, there's, there's apps for the Pebble, and there's actually apps for the uh, Sony smartwatch I mentioned in the review that let you do the same thing um, with your phone. But it doesn't open my house door and it doesn't uh, sign me into my, my laptop uh, and things like that that it could do. Best Buy is now selling uh, what is it called? Kimo or Kibo or Ki Kigo or something like that. It's it's the it's the Bluetooth deadbolt. Um, yeah. So it, they're, they're slowly moving that direction but it's, it's going to be just a complete nightmare because there, there will be no standards for it uh, and you know that, that's why earlier today on Twitter I was I was saying that it, we need Harmony, iRobot, Nast, and Dyson to just merge and like take over the home. Oh man! Because no one else is going to do this in a way that makes any sense. Uh, and Nast obviously has like a, a plan, a roadmap, but they're moving very slowly. So maybe with some additional horsepower, they would be able to move a little quicker. But yeah, I mean. You know, all these companies are coming up with their own solutions for it. It's it's a great idea. They just need to move faster, and they need to do it in a way that is standardized. When you say harmony, do you mean the Logitech harmony? 
Yeah. Yeah. But but Logitech Logitech said like six months ago that they want to spin off Harmony, right? So spin it right off into Nest's Nest. Yeah, just yeah, <laughs> spin it off into into Nest's Nest, and then maybe James Dyson will airblade it into a. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm, come up with some. No, dude, you should appeal. Use a bagless vacuum. Yes. Yeah, All right, guys. I, I mean, just, just, just before we do wrap up, I, I do think that there's the kernel of a utility here with using the smartwatch as a security device. I mean, you guys remember a couple of podcasts ago, Dieter was asking, what is the smallest, tiniest Bluetooth you know, transceiver that I can have in order to you know, do that security and unlocking thing? Um, and if you put it in the watch, that is the thing that is most secure among all your devices because it's literally strapped to you. You know, even, even Google Glass isn't, you know, strapped to you. I, 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 don't, I don't really have another way of saying that. Uh, so, I personally, if you make a smartwatch that, you know, is, is sy- syncs up with, with the computer and just unlocks it, powers it up from sleep when you're next to it, etc., and just does these things really smoothly. Like I say, I don't want the Sony uh, smartwatch to experience where everything is barren and then I have to go and hunt around and do things. I just need it to be out of the box, working, beautiful and lovely uh, and impressive to nearby ladies. I think that is where you know smartwatches can really start taking off. And on that note, Impressing the Ladies wraps up this episode of the Verge Mobile Show. So uh, we thank you for listening and tuning in. Uh, if you want to follow us, you can, of course, follow us at Verge. Uh, and I'm DC Seifert. Vlad is Vlad Savov. Evan is Evan Rogers. That's right. And Chris is Z-Power. And Dieter Bone is at Backlon. Uh, and hopefully he'll be joining us again next week. Uh, and if you're in the U.S., have a happy holiday. Eat some turkey or tofurkey or whatever you like to eat. And we'll see you guys next week. Deuces. Later. See ya. Bye.